Hi, I'm Fernando Pereira, and today we shall talk about control flow analysis. We will leave the realm of data flow analysis behind to talk about something that today is known as constraint-based analysis. Control flow analysis is mostly used to optimize programs that contain function calls. Let's start with a simple example. Consider this program. How should it be optimized? You can stop the video and think about the four questions on the right side of the figure. Notice that this program contains a function call. So any effective optimization would have to go across the boundaries between different functions. Here's the control flow graph of the two functions that we had in our example. We know that the CFGs are related, but how are they related? What's the glue that connects these two CFGs? Well, we can build a kind of interprocedural CFG by connecting the calling point of each function with its return point. Here's a, an interprocedural version of the CFG. In this new expanded CFG, we can run constant propagation, for instance, and then we would be able to even solve the entire loop at compilation time. Let's complicate our optimization a bit. Now, instead of calling the function explicitly, we are calling a function pointer. How can we find out the interprocedural control flow graph? The goal of today's class will be to answer this question. And to do this, we shall rely on the work of Alan Shippers. We will be using the techniques first presented in his paper, Control Flow Analysis in a Scheme, that was published in PLTI 1988. That's the only paper that I know that contains the word oops, and that's why I love it so much. The control flow analysis of Alin Shivers is useful to reconstruct the CFG of programs that contain dynamic dispatch. Dynamic dispatch is the act of calling a function through a pointer. That's pretty common in object-oriented programming languages, but a kind of dynamic dispatch also happens in functional programming languages, where we have higher-order functions, that is, functions that are passed as parameters or returned from other functions. We will focus on functional programming languages in this class, but we will also show examples from languages like Python and Java. So here I have a program in a SML. That's the functional programming language that we will be using from now on. Would you like to try to figure out what's the value of this program? Trickier trick question. What's the CFG of this program? We have functions being passed left and right all over the program. It's hard to figure out how its CFG will look like. And here's an example of code in Python that also does some dynamic dispatching of functions. The question here is which version of add, the method add, is called at the end of the program. That version implemented in class A or that version implemented in class B? Notice that this answer depends on the program's input. One of the cool things about knowing the target of function calls is that we can inline them once we know them. Inlining is a very effective compiler optimization. Do you know why? Inlining avoids the cost of performing a function call. This cost involves passing arguments from caller to callee. But the main benefit of inlining, actually, is that it enables more optimizations. Most compiler optimizations are restricted to a single function, that is, 
they are intra-procedural. So inlining sort of extends the reach of an intra-procedural optimization to the whole program. For instance, even with an interprocedural CFG, we cannot do constant propagation in this program. Can you think on why? Think about it. The arguments of Aerith are constant, but they are both passed to the same variables, which are the formal parameters of Aerith. And in this case, we have different constant constants colliding, leading to a non-constant abstract value, as we had seen on the class when we saw constant propagation. We would not be able to do constant propagation here. So, try to figure out why this is true. But once we inline functions, then we can run constant propagation, for we have different a different copy of each function body, and each variable in that body receives only one constant at a time. See that constant propagation would work on the program on the left. However, discovering which function we can inline is very easy. Programs can be very complicated. Even this program here on the left, that's rather small, already makes it hard to pinpoint which functions could be inlined at which places. So in the rest of this class, we will figure out how to discover the necessary information to be able to inline code. And that concludes our introduction to control flow analysis. In the next class, we shall talk about what's a valid solution to a control flow analysis.